Hello, and welcome to another edition of the Photo Focus Podcast. We've got a great episode today, all about Adobe Photoshop. My name's Rich Harrington, and I'm the publisher of Photo Focus. We've been producing education and inspiration for photographers for more than 22 years. On this week's show, we're going to hear from two different guests, Dave Cross, Photoshop Hall of Fame member, and Scott Valentine, best-selling book author. Before we start the show, I'd like to take a moment to thank two of our partners. If you're looking for a new lens for your mirrorless or DSLR camera, be sure to check out Tamron. They've got a wealth of great lenses available that can really change your shooting style. And if you need your copy of Adobe Creative Cloud, be sure to head on over to PhotoFocus and click one of our links. It's a great way to support the website and you can check out some of the techniques that we learn in today's show inside of Photoshop. Okay, first up, it's Dave Cross, Photoshop Hall of Fame member and expert educator, and he's gonna help you understand how to approach Adobe Photoshop. Hi, this is Rich Harrington of Photo Focus, and today we're talking to Dave Cross. I first met Dave many years ago at a Photoshop world when we were both speaking together, and I've always enjoyed Dave's way of teaching Photoshop as well as how to edit. Dave, welcome. Hi, Rich. Gang, thanks so much for having me. Now, Dave, you've been doing editing and computer-based editing for a long time. You started as a graphic designer. You've worked with photographs of the years. How do you approach image editing, and why is Photoshop so key to your workflow? Well, I think the the big thing is, for me, I mean, I've, I've always been probably first and foremost an educator, so I was always teaching classes, and along the way, as you well know, when you when you teach enough, you also learn from your students. So I was lucky enough to pick up some some tips here here and there along the way. And but the biggest thing for me is I found the more I got to know Photoshop, the more and it might sound weird to say this, but it's almost like I started thinking like Photoshop. So, for example, instead of, you know, you'll hear people say, I need to cut that object out of the photograph where in reality, what you need to do is cover it up to make it look like it was never there. So by kind of thinking that way, I found that I could look at a photograph, like for example, today I was working on one as a tutorial where someone asked me, how would you fix this? And right away, as soon as I looked at the photograph, my mind was already going through plan A, plan B, you know, if this didn't work, then I can try that. And uh, I think that's kind of key for me. The, because Photoshop is so powerful, I know that I have multiple opportunities. It's not like if this doesn't work, I'm out of luck. I know I have various things I can try. Well, and that's probably one of the things that could be intimidating to folks about Photoshop is that there is always at least three or four ways to do just about anything. And I, I think that becomes challenging because you can become overwhelmed with possibilities. So when you look at things, how do you filter that out? How do you decide where you're going to start and how you're going to work your way through this? Well, I think part of it is based on my thought process that I realized a long time ago that while there are multiple ways to do things, as you said, and there's almost an overwhelming number of tools, I realized that some time ago that there was really a core of tools that I used all the time. And there are other tools that, frankly, I the only time I ever use them is to show someone why they're outdated and you don't want to use them anymore. So like the, like the quick selection tool versus say the tragic wand. Right, exactly. So over time, you st and that, that core of tools starts to change, like that's a perfect example. You know, I used to have certain techniques and then when the quick selection tool came out and then select subject came out, each time I'd start going, okay, well, that's interesting. That kind of replaces that uh, other method I might have used. So I don't know, I, the last time I counted, I think there's maybe something like 70 tools in Photoshop. But realistically, I think for most people, unless you're doing some very specialized work, you might use 10 on a regular basis, you know? And so if you get to know those, then the other ones you don't really have to worry about. And I know it's easy to say, don't worry about those tools, but that's that's a big part of it is just sort of recognizing that there are always going to be multiple ways and there's always going to be multiple tools, but there are in many cases tools that are going to be either easier or quicker or better. 
It, it's kind of like buying a Swiss Army knife. Like at a certain point, you could have too many tools, and so you only need certain ones. Of course, Photoshop is designed for so many different users, from medical imaging to video professionals to scientists to 3D animators to photographers to designers. So, you know, what's useful to one is not useful to another, but it's still quite powerful, which obviously makes sense. I think Photoshop, I don't know if they still do this, but they used to let you actually customize the menu and hide the tools you didn't want to see because even they realized how overwhelming it was with so many choices. Well, yeah, and, and you certainly can still do that. And one of the things that I remember, uh, I don't remember what version this was, but you may remember this a number of years ago, Adobe decided for probably maybe the first time to actually remove a function. They took out something called Contact Sheet 2. And I never understood why it was called 2. But anyway, um, they took that out because they said no one ever uses that. Well, the small core of people that did and that had actions recorded based on it yeah. and things like that, there was such an outcry that I guess Adobe in a sense said, well, I guess we can't ever take anything out anymore because someone's <laughs> going to be upset. So as a result, that's why there are so many tools. And I think you're right at a certain point, even Adobe said, maybe we should make it so you can hide menu items and, and only show certain tools so that you can make it the interface your own and make it a little easier. And I'm all about anytime you can customize Photoshop to make it better for you, then that makes perfect sense to do that. Well, let's step back from specific tools for a moment and talk about the other challenge that people face. And that is knowing where to begin. You know, I think a lot of people struggle. They take a photo, and these days, particularly when you're shooting raw, there's so much you could do after the camera. But because there's so much you could do, I think most people struggle and they don't know where to start. So I see two things happen. One is, okay, I'm just going to apply random presets and move a few sliders and then effectively give up. And the other is, is oh, I'm just going to go and follow these elaborate tutorials and the more steps that must mean the better. <laughs> when you're trying to teach people to see, you know, look at their image and see like, wow, this is a great cut of meat and I got a few spices here and now I can make this dish. How do you help people visualize their images or understand what is important? Do you have an approach or a triage technique that you use? Well, I think for me, it's, it's perhaps more about the the workflow in terms of what what tool to start with. And, and I'm a big proponent of doing as much as you can in camera raw, or if you use Lightroom, Lightroom, the same basic idea of those raw processors for a couple of reasons, one of which it's just simply more intuitive. You know, when you think about in Photoshop, when someone looks at a photograph and says, I think I need to make it brighter. And then once again, they're faced with, well, what do I use? And if someone told them, will use curves and they've never seen curves before, they would stare at that straight line and go, uh, <laughs> what do I do with this? Whereas with camera raw, because it's more intuitive, I think perhaps people can be more comfortable by going, oh, there's an exposure slider. There's a shadow slider, you know, that, yeah. and knowing that I, I'm also a huge proponent of working non-destructively all the time. And that's one of the hallmarks of, b of both uh, camera raw and Lightroom is the fact that you really can't do anything to wreck your photograph because <laughs> no matter what you do there's always the opportunity to go right back to the original and start again so it, it at least i hope frees people up to think oh so i can be willing to experiment a little more and and i'm definitely not a a huge fan of i mean there's a there's certainly a place for presets but i agree with you that kind of relying on that or making that your oh well i don't know what else to do so i'll use this preset that someone else made and hope that it works for me. You know, uh, I think the biggest place for presets is that they can be a great starting point and be perhaps a great place to show you some of the possibilities, but to kind of break it down and say, well, for this photo, I had this vision when I was taking it. So how can I get towards that? And it does, I, I think even for someone who's brand new, there's nothing wrong with saying, well, move these sliders and see what happens. You know, there doesn't have to be a specific formula to say, well, first you make sure you do exposure first and then this second. I mean, there's something to be said for that, but I think that's one of the beauties of these raw processors is the fact that you can just move some sliders and see what happens, knowing that you can always come back and change your mind or try something different. And I, I think there, you know, a few years back, I actually did an ebook 
all about camera raw. And then I recorded that into a video series. You've done lots of video training. We'll talk about that. But what I was surprised is how many little things were in there that I might have missed. And even as I continue to work with images, you know, oh, I used to always think of split toning as just a gimmick. And then as I've matured, I start realizing that adding little bits of color into my shadows or highlights has a narrative purpose of the mood I'm trying to create. But mm -hmm. the key is subtlety. I think what happens is people learn to use a tool like Photoshop and then they kind of say, okay, I learned that and they stop learning it. And that really limits you because once you've mastered exposure or color correction, then there's color grading and then there's cropping, and then there's fixing perspective issues that were distracting. And I, I don't wanna say it's infinite, because obviously at some point we stop working, but I think it's we've gotten to the point where if you wanted to, you could probably work on an image forever and continue to refine it, much like our, our friend Bert does, Bert Monroe. Mm -hmm. Like obviously in his case, he's not working on an image, he's creating from scratch, and eventually he decides he's done. But we've crossed this realm of infinite possibilities, and you really have to decide when good enough is good enough. Right. Uh, it was. It's not as much now, but it used to be a running joke with my wife and I when I uh, was living in Canada and I had a basement, so that was where my office was. And I would say something like, I'm just going uh, down to the basement for a minute to work on a photo. She's like, yeah, I'll see you in the morning. Because she knew that it was not going to be a simple little, yeah, I'm just going to fix this one thing because then I'd start to notice something else. And you're right. There's no question that part of it is developing the ability to look at your own image and say, that might be enough. So one of the, the techniques or strategies, I guess you could say, that I've used is to get to a certain point and then walk away and work on something else and then look at it tomorrow with fresh eyes. And sometimes, hopefully, you look at it and go, actually, that looks pretty good as is. Yeah, and, and, and that's good. Those fresh eyes are important. A lot of times we're in a rush to publish. I also sometimes will use that technique two ways. One is after working for a while, when I reach the end, I almost always use the equivalent of the fade command. Either I'll blend back the original image or I'll blend the smart filters or use the fade slider and Luminar just to sort of, you know, I find that sometimes as we edit, we over edit cumulatively, like they compound and it's a little too much, so I back it off. Or sometimes I find myself going back to photos that I edited a while ago and realize that while I love those pictures, you know, I want to take a fresh approach with fresh eyes of where I'm at right now. I, I think we sometimes don't separate the editing process from the photography process in us. Mm -hmm. We feel like we have to edit the picture right away or that once we've edited it, it's crossed off the list and can never be revisited. Right. And I think also we learn new techniques. So to go back and look at an image that you did five years ago, you might use new tools that weren't there like dehaze or something that wasn't even an option back then so to or, be able or even to, the better raw engines now which can yes, recover sure. more detail and highlights than they ever used to the old files look better yep for sure so that's definitely something i always suggest to students especially if you have an image that you're particularly proud of that you did x years ago why not go back and take a fresh look at it and see what else you come up with you might end up with the same thing or you might take a whole different path yeah, things continue to evolve. Well, Dave, you know, you're a Photoshop Hall of Fame member. You've been using the tool from the very beginning. One thing that many people struggle with, I know a lot of photographers who stop in Lightroom and they never want to move beyond that. You know, Lightroom was kind of Adobe's attempt to look at the imaging workflow and simplify it because Photoshop had evolved with so much useful and good baggage, but so many options that it was intimidating. But I think there are things that really only Photoshop can do. You know, for me, when I'm doing my panoramic photography or my time lapse photography, there are certain things between batch processing and stitching and things that I can only do in that tool and, and corrections that are so advanced that are wonderful, like adaptive wide angle, that it's worth me taking the time to go in there. But a lot of people are afraid of it. So what would you say to somebody who, you know, maybe they've got the photography plan, but they, every time they open up Photoshop, they just sort of look at it and then close it and run away scared. What would you say <laughs> to help get them over that fear? Well, I think 
you know, one thing that's got may sound a little odd, but it's if you think back to not to say that we want to revert to our kindergarten days, but but it, I, I have a, a grandson now that's about two and a half years old, and it's really interesting to see him explore. You know, no fear. Everything is just like, oh, what's this? You hand him paper and crayons, and he just starts experimenting and playing because that's what he does. So, I think the perhaps the place to start is to know that you can't do anything to again wreck your photograph. So there's, you know, if if you open it in Photoshop and you're kind of like, ooh, there's so much just try something really simple you know look at a tutorial that says here's how to use the spot healing brush to take out an object and try that and just you know get yourself some small successes so you feel like oh that was not as hard as i thought you might look at something and say well overall i really like this but there is one specific thing i wish it looked like this or i wish that can of coke wasn't in the foreground or whatever it might be so i think and you mentioned this earlier that there's a temptation to go looking for tutorials and some of them are the you know here's how to make an exploding planet tutorial it's like i'm not sure i guess if you wanted to make an exploding planet for some reason but start with the simple things look for tutorials that just says here's a two minute tutorial that tells you how to do this and it's you know something simple that you can achieve and you can look at it and say oh well that makes me feel better it wasn't as hard as i thought and if you really mess up and it falls apart you can always you know revert and start again or you know th th there's always there's always backup plans to mean you should you should feel completely okay with just trying things and see what happens yeah, and I think, you know, with with Photoshop there are so many problems that it can solve quickly. Like I watch people struggle to remove acne inside of a tool like Lightroom. You know, yes, it's non-destructive and that's great, but there's a reason why the content aware fill tools are destructive because it solves problems. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason why there's skin retouching plugins from multiple manufacturers because not working non-destructively is great until you don't want to work non-destructively. And we can still have undos and other things, but I, I watch people sort of accept that, okay, I got this thing that does these things really well, but now I need to open a can and I don't have a can opener, but I bet if I just keep stabbing this thing with a knife, eventually I'll get through. I'll tell you a quick little story. When I used, to, when I lived in Canada, I worked for an Apple dealer and we uh, were a small dealership and at one point we hired an accountant for the first time and his name actually believe it or not was john excel which we thought was hilarious and he didn't get the joke because it was spelled differently but anyway yes. he literally used excel for everything like if he needed to write a letter he would click in the first cell and keep typing until he felt he needed to start a new line and click on the next cell and we we're like john you know you could use microsoft word he's like but i know how to use excel and yes. it's like that's the old story that, you know, the right tool for the right job is like, well, yeah, yeah, you can write a letter in Excel, but do you really want to? You know, you, why not use something that has like all these features that are designed for that purpose? And it's kind of the same thing with Lightroom or Photoshop. Yeah. I talked to my mother-in-law and she's a medical person and she's used to giving presentations, but then she'll try to design a poster in PowerPoint. And I'm like, <laughs> even if you didn't want to use something else, like use Word or use Publisher because it has the right tool for the job. Right. Yeah. So you've been teaching people Photoshop for a while. You've, you know, many people will know you from different conferences and online, but recently uh, you've launched a educational event called the Photoshop Summit. What was the idea behind this? What were you trying to solve other than the fact that for a while and probably for a while longer, it's been difficult to get together in person? Has this allowed you to try out some new ideas and training or to to help more people in different ways? So the idea behind the Photoshop Virtual Summit, it, it I'd had the idea for a while, even before the pandemic started, that just an, a, a way to do a conference where people who either didn't want to or couldn't afford to travel somewhere. And so the idea had been kind of stewing for a while, but when the pandemic started, I thought, well, if, if there's ever a time for people who need to learn virtually, it's now. So I called a bunch of my friends who happened to be Photoshop instructors, and we, we kind of pretty much threw it together in a short amount of time. But the response was, was fantastic, because people were like, this is great, because I'm 
right at a point where I'm starting to worry about what the future holds and how am I going to move forward? And this gives me something to look forward to. And we did a, it's a week long event and 40 classes. So we've, we've done two of them now and both have, have met with great success. And, and for me, one of the most gratifying comments I get is when people say very heartfelt thank yous about this, this helped me get through lockdown and gave me something to work on and, and, and to learn. And, and the fact that a very common comment was when's the next one, which is always a great thing to hear when you're organizing an event and people want to know as soon as it's over, when is the next one? Well, and, and fortunately you picked a, t- a topic that has plenty of learning there. So it's mm-hmm. good that people are willing to deep in. Um, one of the things I always noticed, you know, you and I spoke at Photoshop world through the years, and I always went out of my way to go and watch other instructors because I found as much as I thought I understood something, I would learn something from seeing somebody else's approach. And even though I wasn't a product photographer, I'd go watch, you know, Jim DiVitale teach his workflow and mm-hmm. get these ideas about changing objects or color or organization. And even though I didn't do pre-press, I would go and watch Dan Margolis talk about lab color and some of its benefits. And that made me start to think about color differently. And then I applied that to my motion graphics work and my video work. Do you find other areas that are inspirational to you or other instructors that you've seen speak at your summit who, you know, just help open up new ideas for you and excite you? Is there any techniques or areas that you think people should be more open to, even if it's not their style of imaging? For sure. First of all, I'd say definitely. And and I like I love watching anyone who's good at teaching whatever their topic is, even things that aren't, you know, specific or related. But I particularly enjoy um watching like it I was the same at Photoshop world I would go and watch people like David Zeiser doing wedding photography because it would give me ideas to see see how he took the photographs and the approach he would take and kind of the vision he had I'd sort of a interpret that and say well how can I take that kind of frame of mind into when I'm looking at images or layouts I'm trying to do in Photoshop that might be more technically a design graphic design type function but at the same time you're going to look at at the aesthetic that's created by a photographer that's creating something in you know through their photography so or someone like Joel Grimes and how he would light things help me to look if I was editing a file maybe I was doing some compositing and seeing how he would work with light and shadow would help me think about creating realistic looking shadows to help sell uh, a, a composite image to make sure it looked realistic. So yeah, for sure, I'd say any any kind of artistic endeavor that you can see someone teaching, there are certainly ways to adapt it to the kind of editing or design work you want to do in Photoshop. Now, once you start getting comfortable with editing your images, I think it's really easy to get stuck in a rut. Do you have any areas that you see as sort of Um, common stumbling blocks or things that get in the way of people fully bringing their images to life? Any areas where they should pay more attention to? Um, I think the biggest thing for me is that when we alluded to it earlier with presets, but I would also throw in things like actions where I'll see people say, oh, there's this action I can get that if I hit the play button, it will create this look that I, and I really like that look. And it's like, uh, that's okay. I mean, I understand that, but I'd much rather think about how I could create my own action that could help me do my own work and as opposed to just clicking a button and getting a look that someone else created. So I think the temptation to fall, I don't want to call it fall into the trap, but maybe that's what I'm thinking, is it's just almost too easy to have a bunch of preset buttons that you press and go, there, that's the combination that I like. And I suppose there's nothing wrong with it on some level, but to me, it's it's. I'd prefer to maybe use that as a starting point and build on it, and and try to come up with a look or a, a a style that you find is kind of what you're looking to do yourself. Yeah, and I I think there's a middle ground there, like much like having spices in a kitchen where you need certain ingredients. You know, I think things like camera profiles and lookup tables or LUTs can be very useful as an ingredient to quickly help you get a step in the right direction. 
And I think even having some curves presets or having a library of textures that you've built up or acquired are great. But I agree with you. Like when you hit a button and it's done and you don't have the skills or the comfort to step in there and modify along the way, then you're kind of just buying a look and you're stuck and you can't change it and you can't deal with what happens when it doesn't work right or what happens when I want to do something a little different. Right. And I, I build on that and say, like, I'm a big believer. I'm always talking to people about something that I refer to as a starter action, which means it doesn't do the entire end to end process. But what it does do is get you closer to the end result. So, for, for example, if you're always adding curves, adjustment layers uh, to paint with light and dark instead of going through the process of adding curves adjustment layer and adding a mask and so on, record an action that just does that part. Yeah. And then anytime you want to do some painting with light and dark, you just hit the play button and now you're still being creative on an individual image basis, but you've still got to that point quicker than, than each do repetitively doing the same things each time you just make your life simpler. You're still being creative on an individual basis, but you're getting there faster. I make my own presets all the time and I use AI tools where I can dial in the look I'm going and then let the images sync or you know save time that way. So there's nothing wrong with saving time. Mm -hmm. I, I think the key is, is that you kind of have to own that or build up the ingredients that you need, but still have control over the final results. For sure. Well, Dave, this is all very helpful stuff. Do you have any other things that are exciting you right now that you think other people should know about? Any technology you're using or any techniques you've been noodling around in Photoshop that you think other people might want to play with? I've got to say that that years ago when I was teaching Photoshop, I would be hesitant to say, you know, don't rely on the automated tools because, you know, can they really be that great? But now I'm changing my tune because I do a lot of work with compositing. And I love the idea of taking photographs with Photoshop in mind with the idea of doing compositing and the combination of like select subject and some of the AI behind that. I mean, things that used to take a long time. The technology is getting so much easier now that it's it really is something that people can feel comfortable exploring because you don't have to be have as much expertise perhaps as you used to have, like maybe even three or four years ago. Yeah, no, it's certainly changed a lot. I, I've worked on two different photo technologies that both relied on AI and learning more about AI and how it works really opened my eyes to understand that the same way in which you and I used to take knowledge and convey it through classes and convey it through books and videos, and those are still very important because AI can't do everything, but a lot of these skills the computer can be a student as well. And if you give it enough examples and enough input, well, nine times out of 10, it can solve the problem for you in a somewhat automated way. I think it's important that we open our minds to this. I see people who use Photoshop like they used it 20 years ago when they learned it in college and mm -hmm. they haven't grown. And Photoshop continues to grow. All these tools continue to grow. So if you don't open your mind to the new technologies, well, then you, why do you keep paying money for it? <laughs> <laughs> I agree completely. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Well, good. I, I'm glad you point out that people should take a look at some of those tools. Anything else in the program exciting you or you think is worth a second look? Well, I think there's there's always something and that's that's part of it is just to be open to the possibilities so that you can't always believe the hype. You know, sometimes a, a new tool is described and it really doesn't live up to the hype. But, you know, these days I'd say more often than not, it, it is. So it's well worth exploring, as you said, and don't rely necessarily on the quote unquote old methods you used to use. Be willing to explore the new things as well. Well, Dave, I'm glad that you've helped give us some perspective on how to approach Photoshop, as well as some of the things that have gotten easier in recent years. Uh, folks, do check out the, the Photoshop Virtual Summit. It's a great opportunity for learning. Anything else you'd like to share with folks on how they can connect with you or resources to check out? Well, if anyone's interested, my training site is learningphotoshop.cc, where I have a member-based uh, training site, both short tutorials as well as in-depth courses. So that's where I spend most of my time 
in addition to the Photoshop Virtual Summit. And that's a great resource, folks. I encourage you to check that out. Dave has been teaching for many years and makes very approachable training that's just designed. Uh, you know, I, I know we sometimes joke about the exploding planet, and if you need to make an exploding planet, that's great. And you know, there are people that need to do graphic design, but your training, Dave, has always been super practical and just helps people get the job done, which is great because it means there's more time for photography or more time for family and other things. So uh, congratulations on, on all the things you've been up to, and thanks for bringing the Photoshop Virtual Summit to life. I appreciate you joining us on the show, and uh, I hope everything goes well for you. Well, as, as same to you. I appreciate the kind words, and it's always been my passion to teach Photoshop one way or another. So I, I love spreading the word, and I thank you very much for having me on this chat to talk even more about my favorite subject. A big thank you to Dave Cross for sharing those inspirational ideas. Be sure to check out the Photoshop Summit if you're interested in learning more about upcoming training events. Speaking of upcoming training events, we have a new conference that's going to be launching in May. It's the Visual Storyteller Conference. We'll have more details for you soon, and you can keep an eye on photofocus.com to learn more. But it is a free event spread over three days, plus a photo walk to help you really take your photography and online video to the next level. Before we go on to our next interview with Scott Valentine, I'd like to take a moment to thank both Exire and Luminar. Both of these software tools harness the power of artificial intelligence in different ways. Exire makes it very easy to find any photo on your hard drive, doing intuitive searches without the need for tags or keywords. Plus, if you'd like to really edit your images more quickly and unlock new creative options, be sure to check out Luminar AI. It's available as both an application and a plugin. Okay, let's hear from Scott Valentine about the hidden power of blend modes and what we could do to really enhance our images. Hi folks, and thanks for joining today. I'm really excited. We're gonna have a chance to talk to a Photoshop expert. We're joined by Scott Valentine today, and he is the author of a, a recently released book called The Hidden Power of Adobe Photoshop, Mastering Blend Modes and Adjustment Layers for Photography. Scott, welcome. I'm glad to have you here today. Thanks, Rich. I'm really excited to talk to you. You have tackled something here that I think is a great topic, which is that, you know, Photoshop adds this sort of hidden power and as a photographer or a designer you can un really unlock things that you can't do in a traditional photo editing tool thanks to some of these things and you really hit both of them in your book here i'm fans of both technologies blend modes and adjustment layers i, I often tell people that blend modes are kind of the secret recipe to unlocking things but uh, I, I know that i'm speaking to the choir here with you but let's start with the beginning point of, I think a lot of folks struggle with Photoshop. Could you describe your own journey to sort of, you know, becoming a Photoshop master? You've used Photoshop for many years. How did you get into it? And, you know, what are some of the major uh, steps you've taken along the way to become comfortable with Photoshop? That's a really timely question, considering that I actually got into design work in general using Adobe, well, it was Macromedia Flash uh, back in the day. And I had worked on learning how to do code. So I got hired uh, with a web development company to actually build interactive graphic displays. The first day I started, um, their graphic designer quit. And they said, quit, can you draw a battleship? I had never even opened Photoshop before. Um, so I tried to teach myself. I took some night classes. And by the end of the, the first couple of weeks, I was really getting into the design, the ethic of the user interface, um, the, the whole experience. And just, I kind of dove in head first. So one of the things that I figured out early on was that the instructional materials were almost entirely geared towards a, a predetermined solution. Here's this target that I want to hit, this thing that I want to do. And the educational material would drive you step by step to doing that. And along the way, you might be using tools that you would never even know to look for. So there was a big gap in the vocabulary and the understanding of the tools. Um, a few years into that, I started participating in online forums doing much the same thing, problem solving. And the great joy that I had at that time was taking in a new challenge or deconstructing other people's work 
and trying to figure out a way to explain this to people in such a way that not only could they get to the end result that they could see, but also so that they could develop their own unique take on it. Um, and that required explaining how the tools work. So that's kind of been my approach this whole time. My, my background's actually in physics. So I spend an awful lot of time trying to deconstruct as much as I can into fundamental levels that I can put back together in new and creative ways. Well, that makes sense. And I, I think a lot of times with Photoshop, people become overwhelmed by the possibilities or the options. You know, uh, if you are a Lightroom user, everything's kind of in a linear order. You've got all your tools in one stack. You kind of work top to bottom and you get the job done. Now, there's a few things hidden here or there, but with Photoshop, we have panels, we have menus, you've got all these options, you've got plugins, and pretty quickly it just expands and it become overwhelming. So with that in mind, could you give us a couple of reasons why a photographer might choose to use Photoshop as a companion to other tools that they use, or you know why they might finish their images in Photoshop rather than stopping in a parametric image editor like Lightroom or Capture One or Luminar? Why would they go to that extra level of stepping into Photoshop? I, that's an excellent question. And I think it has to do with how we express ourselves in, in uh, driving towards a creative vision. I think it's also fair to point out that photography in the in the current sense is no longer simply about adjusting your technical elements the exposure aperture focal length anything like that um it's not just about capturing the picture but it's about telling the story and we do that now in much more creative ways that that call for a lot more depth the traditional photography approach is to capture a scene and tell a story about that scene directly and you manipulate things like uh, contrast and colors. You can stop with a lot of the current tools that you mentioned and get just amazing results with um, not a whole lot of effort. And the mastery there comes in showing restraint. In Photoshop, if we're talking just about the creative stuff and not worrying about the corrections, you have an opportunity to explore tools and push them far beyond what the developers ever intended. And this is really something that I've I've dug into quite a bit is how do you take a tool and break it in beautiful ways? How do you find those ragged edges that are not intended by any stretch of the imagination, but pull something creative and unique out of it? Yeah. And I, I think about that, for example, and I, I know that you're a big fan of adjustment layers of some technology like a gradient map that used to be done to make these awful backgrounds and you know these harsh gradients and all of a sudden someone figures out oh well we could start to load up the colors and tonality that were evocative of some of these classic printing techniques and then gently blend them in the folder into the photo and you go from a digital image to a very filmic image by introducing a new color palette that you've mapped to the the highlights to the shadows with the blend mode and uh, to me that's one of those examples of where sort of classic graphic arts and photography suddenly collide because you're introducing the equivalent of, you know, chemical processes and paper textures that you never would have had in a digital world. Exactly. And to extend the example just a little bit further, the cover of my book demonstrates that the the philosophy behind this pretty well. It's all done with the clone stamp, but I've created a set of uh, brushes and everything that obviously we can't see in this medium. But the book itself exploits, or the cover of the book exploits a tool that was really meant for small corrections. Um, the, the clone stamp tool was really meant to be able to take an imperfection and cover it up with another part of the image. And I've extended that with creative brushes to give a very design oriented look. And that's, I think, where photographers can really benefit is by exploring tools kind of out of context. I think the the lines of creativity have become blurred. It's perfectly fine, as you mentioned with those other tools, to stop and you don't have to push it. But then there's other times where having a more graphic edge or having more creative control over color or compositing is desirable. So I think it's one of those things where it's a personal choice. No one is going to say to a traditional photographer, you have to be able to do these things. But it can open up new options, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And there's, 
I, I think that's a great point that you don't have to feel obligated to use any or all of these tools. Um, for a long time, Photoshop was the only thing photographers had out there that really gave them the power to control color and brightness and contrast. Um, and some of the other tools were really kind of left aside for either web developers or graphic designers. But as those creativity lines kind of blur, as you mentioned, it's nice to have those options. But nobody should feel compelled by any part of the market, by their peers, uh, or anything to do something that that doesn't feel authentic to them. Yeah, and I, I think for me, one of the reasons why Photoshop continues to be useful is there's a need to combine imagery. You know, for some me, sometimes that's a panoramic workflow, but other times it's just blending of layers or textures together. And you know, Photoshop gives you a lot of options. I, as I look through some of your work, you do a lot of creative compositing. You also use it for just very straightforward image enhancements. Um, I think blending modes and layers are the manual way of doing what a lot of plugins do automated, but the manual way sometimes frees up more control. You know, a good example for me is I'll frequently take a black and white adjustment and blend it in with the image to use it as a way to really have control over tone and contrast. So instead of being trapped into having just clarity or other tools, I could use that black and white layer plus blending modes to really bring out the image that I want and have greater control. Even though I never intend to deliver black and white, I'm just using the black and white image as a way to bring out contrast and to emphasize certain areas, like to bring out the hair more than the skin tones. Right. And I, I actually love the idea that we still call these tools. Um, I don't know exactly what other words we would use, but think about this. In, in traditional real world um, applications, you are going to build something with physical materials. And we learned early on as a, as a, as a species to do things like cut, right? So we cut wood and we did that with sharpened tools, sharpened stones. Um, eventually we started using other specialty things, metal cut into certain shapes. And at this point now, if you tell someone that you need a saw, you have the option of figuring out, do you need a coping saw? Do you need a timber saw? Do you want one of those little things that vibrates its way through drywall? You have infinite variety because the uses have expanded. And I think it's incumbent on at least some creatives out there to take these tools and figure out what are the new things that we want to do. Compositing is a great example. And in my book, I actually talk about the exact, uh, exact technique you were discussing using black and white. The approach that I take there is to recognize that Photoshop thinks about your images. It thinks about the pixels it displays to you in terms of brightness and specific color values, but it does that with levels of gray on each of the color channels. And so using a black and white tool is incredibly insightful for being able to control very subtle changes in tonality and luminosity throughout your image, irrespective of the colors. And I think that's that's incredible. You know, that's a, a great insight that took a long time for us, for some of us to come to. Right. And, and I see you use gradients a lot, gradual blends of colors. What is it about some of these tools of putting these two pieces together? So, you know, let's break these technology down because not everyone's a comfortable in Photoshop. You know, so you, we've mentioned a couple of technologies here. You talked about channels which are gonna be sort of the components of color, you know, the, the red, green, and blue, or the cyan, magenta, yellow, and key that add up to the image. But then you also talk about blending, these blending layers and blending tools. How does this technology work? Just give, me a, give us a working definition to sort of help people out understand this idea that, you know, not only could you have a curve like Lightroom, but that curve can be blended so it's not as globally applied, right? Right. And if I understand your question correctly, the, the underlying principles here are trying to understand how a computer thinks of color and how it translates what it knows to be color into something that human vision can perceive. Is that kind of what you're... Yes. Yeah. Get? Okay. So it, I think it's fascinating that the development of computer displays has tried to track along with the capability of human eyeballs in that most of the standards go along with how the biological component of your eyes perceive light, perceive frequency, 
and perceive these distinctions so that we can see in the real world the difference between a light blue and a dark blue or two shades that might have the same luminosity value, but their hues are different. And even though the luminosity might be the same, our eyeballs will tell us that there is a brightness difference between them based on how sensitive we are to one color versus another. Uh, computer vision has has tried to reconcile that, and there's been a lot of different models that try to balance the perceptual elements with the technical elements. Something else I talk about in the book is the difference between brightness and luminosity. Luminosity, in the in a more technical sense, is really the energy that comes off of a surface. So when light reflects off of something, there's an associated power. That, that goes along with how much light is reflected, and that alters the, the color. Your eyes may not be attuned to the way that particular surface reflects light. So um, you don't perceive power the same way that a sensitive instrument might. Applications like Photoshop try and reconcile that by giving you a little bit of weighted value. So you know, green is given a little more weight than, say, blue. The computer thinks they're exactly the same. It doesn't have any idea about perception. So Photoshop tries to balance these things. Now, that's kind of going down the rabbit hole, but this applies to the way the tools in Photoshop work. Each of the, way, each of the tools that you look at has a different set of controls that affect how you manipulate that data, the information that makes up your image that gets displayed on your screen. And while fundamentally they're only dealing with uh, say the hue value and the luminosity value, the brightness is your perception. And the way you manipulate those tools matters. So you have to choose the the interface or the, the set of controls that make sense to you and to your creative vision. Um, blending them is something that really takes uh, experience, I think. When you know that you can convert a, an image to black and white in maybe half a dozen different ways, then you see that you can manipulate those black and white elements to give you different impact of color. And I think there's a, there's a significant challenge for the artist to, to explore these tools and to kind of understand how to get them to feel a little more natural so that your expression can come through. Yeah, and I think an easy way for people to get sort of introduced to this idea of using blend modes is to try – thinking about it as a way to colorize parts of an image, you know, taking a color or a texture and blending it with modes on there. I usually will try changing a blend mode before I try changing the global opacity. I find opacity to be a very gross tool and get much finer control with the mode. But I think a lot of people are afraid to experiment. They don't realize that the blend modes are sort of grouped by function, like lighten versus darken versus color manipulation. And they get really tied up into these crazy definitions that the user manual has. Do you have a good introductory exercise that someone can try? Like one of my favorites is duplicate a layer and blur it, and then try changing the blend mode and look at how the digital image starts to take on more filmic qualities of gentle glows or richening of colors. Do you have any other starter recipes that people can try out to sort of get this concept of blend modes down? Absolutely. One of my favorite things to do is to start off people with gradients. Um, in, the, in the opening sections, I've I've got a couple of example files that, that can be built fairly easily that reduce images down to just a few simple colors, um, maybe some patterns. But the gradients themselves give you a range from one value to another or one, uh, one color to another. The reason for this is blend modes are really math. And I know that that turns off a lot of people to think about. But if you, if you think about inputs and outputs, and don't worry about the actual numbers or equations, you have an input value, which is one layer or the information on one layer, and it can consist of a solid color or any other combination of colors and brightness. And you combine that with another one. That's what a, a blend mode is. The results that you get out uh, sometimes aren't exactly predictable. And we have a tendency to try these out on our own images but we also have an emotional connection with the images that we're working on. We've shot them or our clients provided them to us. And we'll look at these things. And as we experiment, 
we might develop um, a, an emotional response to the output. That emotional response isn't always fair to the blending mode. You could look at something like um, the dissolve blending mode, which actually kind of hides pixels at random based on an opacity value. And you look at that and you think, well, this is kind of a useless effect. I have absolutely no purpose in mind for this. But when you abstract it, when you take it away from your emotional element and you put it into these little gradients or patterns, now you might be able to see, oh, there's an effect that I can develop from this. I can use this as a basic background for textured noise or raindrops or anything like that. So I think it's important to explore it first with the images that you do know. But when you're trying to ingrain the effects into your head and you're trying to build that expressive capability, I think it's vital to abstract it, to remove your emotional component by working on images that you don't have an attachment to or that you don't have an expectation of. So, so you mean like yeah. download some stock or borrow some photos from a friend to play with? That would be a great way to do it. But I think even more fundamentally, just using solid color blocks or uh, stepwise patterns, which is basically instead of having a smooth gradient from, say, black to white, you might have a solid black at 20%, 40%, 60%, and then overlay that with other other patterns that you've rotated. Mm -hmm. I think that really gives people a good feel um, without biasing them against a particular, uh, particular blend mode. One of my favorite techniques as well is I frequently will capture textures. So sometimes I do this by going to the art store and buying papers or, you know, if we're cleaning out a garage or I'm, you know, in a, a back in the day when we would travel, like stopping into an antique store, I might get some weathered paper or textures. And other times it's just with my digital camera. And, you know, I'm the weird guy walking around taking pictures of the ground and the walls and the peeling paint. But all of a sudden, mixing that in with the photo creates these incredible options. I, I know you're a fan of texture. Um, how do you use these things? And you know, do you have any advice for people when they're starting to, to play with combining images? Do you like to put the image on top of the texture, the texture on top of the image, multiple copies with opacities mixing? How do you play with this? Well, when I'm working specifically with textures, um, I, I tend to like to put them on top and change the blending mode that way at first. But um, I, I will tell you that I swap the order around quite a bit, mostly due to experience with these things. So I don't necessarily recommend um, changing the order too much right away when you're trying to learn how the blending modes affect uh, your imagery, because it's easy to get lost. I, I like to let people isolate just one variable at a time. And so putting the Texture on top of a photograph is is a great start to all of this. Also, as you mentioned, duplicating and rotating can give you repeating patterns, even from somewhat random textures. And seeing those patterns develop uh, just from simple things like rotation or scaling can really add a lot of impact, especially when you're starting to look at how the textures interact between layers. So you mentioned a rough paper texture, putting that over the top of skin can really give you some very interesting effects. And um, it's not something you can describe to people until they actually go look at it. I, I'll give people another super practical example, which is um, product photography or commercial photography. There's a lot of times when we're shooting something and it's supposed to have a very specific color because it's a branded color. And maybe because of the light or you know, slight defects or just the capture, that color of the brand isn't coming through. But by layering that color in, even as far as the Pantone value and then blending it back in, it's easy to reintroduce that. Or with the practical example of, you know, you have something like a car, well, each year they might slightly change the model that that color is available, or maybe the sweater has new colors and others are out of stock. You know what they're doing there is using blend modes. They're just taking the object and swapping out color. And when you layer in the new color, it still preserves those shadows and textures and subtle variations of the original, but can take on a whole new property. Yeah, and I think you're giving away a lot of secrets there that um, some uh, some product photographers might want to want to take issue with, because the the reality is, without a tool like Photoshop you would have to reshoot everything and you'd have to go in with very meticulous detail with your uh, color charts and whatever the, the product key is. Um, 
and you have to have very critical development processes. Yeah, we, we absolutely use a color checker on set. You know, um, my company has done some work for Canon through the years and, you know, we have to get that red right. But when we're in post-production working on the photos or video, we absolutely have their logo sitting on a higher layer and we're manipulating the color to get back to that point. You know, this, though, opens up new options, which is, you know, you mentioned what the eye sees. What the eye sees and the camera sees are typically two totally different things. Having these tools available makes makes even the best photographer that much more powerful in expressing their art or in seeing a client's vision to completion. A lot of these things, without, like I said, without Photoshop, you wouldn't be able to do them easily. But we've got tons of opportunity to uh, push things even further. And what's really nice is you can help clients actually visualize new color combinations in very short order. I have some favorite techniques that I use for color replacement and visualization where you can actually, you can match things very quickly and explore a lot of variations. And sometimes that really helps drive product development too. So it's not, it's not just about creative vision for yourself or for the uh, photographer. It's also about helping other people see creatively. Sure. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. So going back to where we started this conversation, Photoshop can be pretty intimidating to a photographer. What do you recommend they pay attention to? Because what I always say when trying to learn a new tool, sometimes it's about knowing what to ignore first. So are there key features that matter most to a photographer? Do you have any practical way to not let Photoshop overwhelm you when you first get started? That's a loaded question, Rich. I think <laughs> I think being overloaded and overwhelmed is part of the experience. Um, and I think it's something that I see happen with students a lot. But I guess maybe there's a piece of advice that goes with that. When you start to feel overwhelmed, it just means that you are having trouble assigning the knowledge that you've learned into something that you've already held on to, right? And this is this actually gets to the core of creativity is seeing things in new ways. That feeling of being overwhelmed should be kind of welcome because it tells you that you're absorbing new stuff. You just don't have any you don't have something to do with it yet. You you bring up an interesting idea there though because I I want to revisit just the idea of a book here in general. I know a lot of people who taught themselves Lightroom, for example, by simply opening up the product and just moving sliders and shaking sliders. Oh, let me try this. Let me try this. They never actually learn what the tool does. I don't think Photoshop's very forgiving to those who just open it up and try to hack their way through. There's something to be said of taking a class or following a book like yours where you say, I want to learn this. You know, There's a Photoshop World Conference. There's many people who have Photoshop classes. Photoshop is that next level, but you kind of got to have a tour guide, I, I guess I would say. It's like I wouldn't recommend just stumbling around in Photoshop hoping to find something you like. The best advice I would give to somebody who's just starting out for Photoshop is to pick specific projects. Uh, find something that has a goal that you can work towards. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the steps, don't be afraid to change things around. So uh, the classic example of kind of a, a cookbook recipe where you're, say, adding a vignette to a photograph, you're, you're darkening the edges. There's a lot of different ways you can do it. Mm -hmm. And if you follow the particular steps for one recipe, vary them, invert the colors, um, see if you can get the same result with a different tool. And that's what I talked about earlier for abstracting is a key element is reducing the number of variables. So when you're just starting off, work towards that goal, pay attention to each of the steps, but also take one of those steps and go wild with it and see what the effects are. Yeah. One thing that you cover in your book that I'm a huge fan on is just how good Photoshop is at creating black and whites. That black and white is not just stripping away the color. And you explore using blending modes and mixing and layering things in. Uh, I think this is a great way. That's an easy way to explore the power of Photoshop and blending modes and layers because there's so many different ways to make a black and white photo. Um, do you have any other techniques like that? Or do you want to walk people through your process of thinking about this as a style of photography? The core approach that I take is to isolate variables. Like I've said a couple of times now, I want to find something, the one thing that I can manipulate and play around with and explore where it looks good and where it looks horrible. And if it looks horrible, can I use that as a foundation for something else? Sure. Um, 
You, 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 know, you bring up a great point there, which is sometimes it's better to push something to the breaking point and back off rather than being tentative. Right. And that's what I mentioned earlier, the beautiful failures. Uh, how do you how do you catalog these things? And, you know, again, having a goal is great. The second part of that, though, is not having a goal and just wandering around. But a lot of us don't have have that much time. We don't have that much luxury to be able to just um, sit down for an hour or two and and wander. Um, and some people just don't have the patience for it. Taking, taking that one thing and jiggling the sliders, um, looking for the breaking points, eventually that stuff soaks in. I used to be a big fan of telling people to take notes. Anytime you do experiments in Photoshop, save a layer, save a layer, write up a few different notes about it. What were you thinking? And then I realized that that really breaks the creative flow. You should do that afterwards and not worry about trying to replicate your own results time and again. That will come with experience. What you should focus on early on is just absorbing, letting letting the tools become natural to you. In fact, the the tagline the tagline that I like to use is "Never let your tools get in the way of your art." Yeah, and and you know, fortunately, Photoshop keeps a running history. Other tools have history as well. I I always tell folks this. You know, you can find that history, those multiple levels of undo. So if you want to see how you did something, you could step backwards. You can use technology like Actions to record what you've done, so that you can encapsulate that. You know, for me, I like to just experiment and then look at what I did in the history. And if I really like something, then I'll typically record an action so that I can use that again in the future. An action is just the recording of the steps and the playing back. So this is great advice. Do you have any other closing advice for those folks who feel that Photoshop was just too hard or they didn't know where to begin? Uh, fight through it. No, I don't know. Um, fighting through it is actually a good strategy for a lot of people. But like I said, pick a goal, uh, pick one or two things that you can focus on and repeat that. It's just like learning an instrument. My perspective on Photoshop is that I, I like to use it specifically as a tool for expression and I have that luxury because I'm not a commercial photographer, so I don't have to meet other people's expectations. My whole obligation is to get people to understand the tools in a way that makes sense to them and and helps them express themselves. So occasionally, if you're if you're just learning and things are difficult, step back and remind yourself that what you're trying to do is get what's in your head or what potential exists in your head out so that you can see it. And that's not an easy process. But you have to let it evolve. You just have to let the expression happen. And like I said, embrace the frustration, embrace the outrage sometimes as acknowledgement that that knowledge is really being seated in your head. Folks, if you want to learn more, be sure to check out Scott's book. It's The Hidden Power of Adobe Photoshop, Mastering Blend Modes and Adjustment Layers for Photography. Uh, it's from Peach Pit Press, and it has a lot of hands-on activities to really help you unlock these ideas. Uh, Scott, any other closing advice or things you'd like people to know so they can get in touch? Well, I'm available online, so I'll, I'll provide that. It's pronounced Scoxel, which... I, you know, back when I thought I was being clever about web URLs, it's Scott and Pixel mashed together. So anyway, um, <laughs> on my it's, blog, it's, hard, have, it's hard to come up with a unique URL these days. It's getting it really is. tough. It is. But that's where I'll put most of my thoughts. Um, I'll have some supporting files for the book and you can get in touch with me through that website. Also, I have a contact button. I am more than happy to, to help explain problems or to help break things down. That's that's what I do. Um, more than being an, an artist in this, I'm an educator, and my thrill in using Photoshop is solving problems. Excellent. Well, folks, I encourage you to check out the book. It's got a lot of creative ideas in it and will definitely help you as a photographer start to get more out of Photoshop than just really you know, getting stuck at the front door. Scott, thanks so much for making time today and for trying to help our folks out. Thanks, Rich. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Scott, for that great information and inspiration. If you'd like to check out Scott's book, it's called The Hidden Power of Adobe Photoshop, Mastering Blend Modes and Adjustment Layers. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. If you'd like to continue the conversation, be sure to head on over to community.photofocus.com. When you're there, you can easily pick up our new free class on printing from photographer Kevin Ames. We've got a limited number of copies we're giving away absolutely free from our partner website, ThinkTap Learn. ThinkTap Learn has got a ton of classes, more than 100 on photography and video, 
to help you learn more about being creative and mastering these digital tools. That's thinktaplearn.com, but you could try out a class for free by just going to community.photofocus.com. Thanks again for listening, and we really appreciate you being a subscriber to our podcast. If you haven't yet subscribed, please head on over to iTunes or your favorite podcasting platform and subscribe to get every episode. Also, if you're looking to print your photos out, a big thank you to our partner over at Exposer. They make a wonderful tool so you can get your images onto your walls and easily swap them every season with a new print. Exposer has a variety of options, including some really cool reusable frames. Thanks again for listening. My name is Rich Harrington, and I'm the publisher of Photofocus.com, and we hope to provide you continued education and inspiration about photography. Photography.